welcome everyone to the Armenian Bar Association Young Lawyers Committee's webinar series on emerging and developing areas of law. This webinar is about esports and gaming. Um, just as some background, each webinar in the, the series is, is geared to provide introductory and useful information for new attorneys who would like to practice in an emerging area, as well as for seasoned attorneys looking to learn more and perhaps transition their practice into an emerging area. So as mentioned, this webinar is about esports and gaming. Um, the next webinar will be in June, and that'll be on entertainment law, and details for that will follow. So we're joined today by three uh, terrific panelists who you'll see on your screens. Um, the panelists are Irene Scholl Tatevosian, who is a senior associate at Nixon Peabody and leads the firm's esports industry group, which is one of the first dedicated esports groups among AMLA 100 firms. Uh, she's the vice president of the Esports Bar Association, and she's often called upon to present at conferences nationwide and comment on legal issues affecting esports, as she's doing today. Um, at Nixon Peabody, Irene is a trial and practicing labor and employment attorney representing employers in all aspects of labor and employment matters. Uh, she often partners with esports and gaming clients, counseling them on the full range of legal issues that they face. Next, we have Alina Bakian who is Associate General Counsel on the Platform and Technology Commercial Team at Snap Inc., which is the company that owns Snapchat, Bitmoji, and Spectacles. As part of her role at Snap, Alina supports Snap Games, which are single and multiplayer games on the Snapchat um, network where Snapchatters can play and interact with their friends. This work includes game development, developer partnerships, licensing and monetization, as well as building out consumer and developer facing terms for SNAP tokens and games. And finally, we have Professor Ellen Zavian, who is Associate Professor at George Washington University and the owner of Easy Negotiation Institute. She began her career in sports law while earning her law degree, at which time she interned for uh, the NFL Players Association. Soon after graduation, she became the first female attorney and agent in the NFL. And throughout her accomplished career in sports law, she's represented the US women's soccer team, softball gold medalists, extreme athletes, um, and has held the title of commissioner for the Central Atlantic Collegiate Conference. On the academic side, Professor Zavian lectures on sports law, event law, entrepreneurship, and personal branding, um, and also serves as the sports moot court coach for George Washington University's teams. If that wasn't enough, Professor Zavian also created the United Break-In Association, which is the global association for competitive uh, break dancers and was instrumental for getting break dancing into the Youth Olympics in 2018 and the Paris Olympics in 2024. So we know who to thank when we're watching break dance 2024. Um, Professor Zavian was also appointed FIFA Player Council representative in 2019. Safe Sport International Trustee in 2021. And in her free time, she's a contributing um, esports expert to the Washington Post, The Launcher, Forbes, along with many other publications. Um, and I'm Jesse Kalashian. I'll be moderating this panel. I'm an associate at Goodwin Proctor, um, focusing on MA. Um, and my interests lie in regulatory aspects of uh, sports and um, antitrust and how it all applies to, to sports. So with all that said, we can go ahead and get started um, with the panel and dive in. Um, just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat boxes or into the Q&A, and we'll try to get to them at the end if uh, time permits. So welcome, everyone, to our panelists. Thank you for being here. Um, I know I've been looking forward to this, so hopefully we can have a, a lively discussion about esports, gaming, um, and really dive into to the issues and the work you do in the space. Um, just as a general matter, we'll start with um, an overview of esports gaming and then kind of go over the issues um, that are prevalent in, in these areas and how we can apply the current frameworks that we have um, in professional sports to esports and gaming and vice versa. So what I think it makes sense to start with is just going over um, what esports are, what gaming is, and then um, kind of diving into the issues. So with that, We'll start with Irene. Um, and Irene, if you could, will you please just give us a, a general overview of esports um, and kind of let us know what esports means in your world and how this is distinguished from gaming, gambling, um, and then if you can just give us some of the basic frameworks that esports are structured around. 
Sure, and I, I'll ask my panelists to jump in um, also, as I'm sure they'll have some things to add. Um, so we'll start with the larger framework, which is gaming. And when we say gaming in this context, we mean video gaming, not like gaming in a casino. Um, so just focusing on the video game industry, the, the first thing to focus on is the publishers, the game developers, in other words. And those are the folks, you know, the Riot Games, the Epic Games, Microsoft of the world that create the games that we all play. Um, and there are games where you just play as a single player. Um, and then there's games that they make that are conducive to competitive competition. So these are games where folks get on in different areas, including in areas all over the world and play competitively. For that, there's just people who game casually. So you go on to one of these games, let's say and you're casually playing with people all over the world, like let's say Fortnite uh, by Epic Games. There's, there's uh, the high school now and more of a collegiate scene as well. And usually when people talk about esports on the professional scale, there's also professional competitive esports competitions, much like you see in traditional sports. So the esports professional scene, depending on the game, so let's focus on one type of game, let's say League of Legends made by Riot Games. They have a whole league that different teams play competitively in. And there's, a, it's just like all other traditional sports, there's a finals, there's a winner. Um, it's a franchise model. Not every game that's in the professional world is like that. They don't necessarily have leagues. And some games um, end up contracting out their tournaments to third party providers that put on the tournaments for them. So depending on the game, you have a different model of what the competitive scene looks like. Um, and even, so that, that kind of explains what the difference is between the esports world, which you can think of as competitive gaming, the gaming world, which is the broader umbrella where you can have casual gaming. And in that umbrella, it's also uh, important to include mobile gaming, which is a huge part of the gaming industry. And a lot more people are playing mobile games than you might have some of the other games, right? Because there's the games on consoles, there's the games on your computer, and then there's games that are also mobile games. So when you look at it as an entertainment industry, gaming is massive. And esports is a subset of that industry. Yeah, thank you for that. Very helpful. And so you mentioned um, the leagues and the organization of it. And so, can you give us a little more information on how esports leagues and the competitions are structured? Um, who runs these competitions? Who owns these competitions? And a little more background on that. Yeah, the important thing to know about esports that is very different than traditional sports is someone actually owns the game. Nobody owns basketball, right? Um, but in esports, the the, per, the person who developed or the company that developed the game owns the game that the, the folks are playing. So typically, the publisher, depending on how involved or not they want to be, in let's say the publisher's case, of they that are very involved, they dictate how the leagues are run. They're the ones putting on the leagues that exist in the franchise model. Those are the riots and the Activisions of the world. They have rules in terms of how the games are supposed to be run. They have code of conduct um, and some other publishers that really didn't want nothing to do with. There's also publishers that I want nothing to do with that and just uh, license out the game for other folks to organize the competition. So it's very, in that sense, it's very different from the traditional sports world. Um, the other things is it's not unionized. Um, and so under, uh, many of the traditional sports we're used to, it's a unionized structure. You have a players association, there's collective bargaining agreements. That doesn't exist in the esports world, at least not yet. Got it. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And so in terms of, I guess, the regulation, right, some publishers are more active and they have their codes of conduct, others don't. Is Are there any universal regulatory concepts or frameworks that apply um, to esports generally, or is it really just kind of on the, the publisher and the provider level? Right now, it's on the publisher and provider level. There uh, have been some organizations that have tried to globalize 
um, the standard standards in the industry, um, none have really been successful. And I don't, I don't know if they ever will be because to be able to do that, you need to get buy-in from all different publishers um, and also the different teams and players. I think that's gonna be very difficult to do. And also given how I just saw a question pop up about the global nature of it, it is very global. Um, um, more so than many sports, uh, like esports is very popular in Europe and Asia as well. So you're dealing with a lot of um, global scale issues. So right now, outside of just what the law that exists that we have applying it to the industry, there's no separate set of laws that apply to it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, one can imagine it would be very tough to get everyone on board and aligned with the variety of games, um, the variety of jurisdictions, rules, et cetera. Um, and then before we wrap up on esports itself and move on to gaming, um, can you just give us a sense of what some of the very high level issues currently impacting esports are? So, what is it that is currently um, being debated, being discussed, and that's important in the esports world? Uh, a big one is the integrity of of the um, of the framework, which I know Ellen is going to address later. Um, another big one is gambling um, and betting. Um, there's all sorts of labor and employment issues. Unionization has been discussed a lot. Um, I mean, there's uh, there's uh, the, I would say the four main buckets are the integrity the gambling, labor and employment, and probably IP are the four big pieces. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you for that very helpful background to have to, to frame the rest of the session here. Um, so with that, we'll now turn to gaming um, and we'll turn to Alina. And so Alina, if you can just give us very quick background on what gaming is and how it's defined um, in your industry, just so we can better understand um, what people mean when they say, you know, they're in gaming. Sure, thanks. Um, I think Irene provided a really good definition and overview of kind of where gaming is versus esports versus gambling. So I do want to clarify again that when we talk about gaming under regulations, um, gaming is also used to define gambling, right? Which is a game of chance where you can win something of value, not necessarily money. And it requires you to put something in a value, usually money when we're talking about like casinos or mobile or online casinos mm -hmm. um, in order in order to win and, and in order to play. So that's not, um, that's not what, what I'm talking about, but that could be a, an issue that we can discuss later. Um, mm -hmm. So gaming is, I mean, it's, it's what we all know, right? It's um, as as Irene mentioned. There's mobile gaming. There's console gaming. There's uh, computer gaming on you know PCs and desktops. I focus almost exclusively on mobile gaming uh, for Snapchat. And um, what's interesting there is that most of those games are pretty like casual and hyper casual games, right? Like all the games that we've all heard of, like. Candy Crush that we've all heard and probably played and we're obsessed with, and currently probably Wordle. A lot of people on here are probably playing that. So it's really, it's not so much about the competition, although a lot of them will have things like statistics or ranking among friends. If you have like on, on Snapchat, if you have friends who also play the game, you'll be able to see things like where you're ranked relative to your friends if they choose to share that information. And that's really just to, you know, get the competitive spirit up and get people more engaged in the game. But it's not competitive in, this, in the same way that esports is, right? It's just something you play on your, uh, you know, on your commute if you're on a bus or something that you just play casually when you're trying to tune out or you're watching a show and you're multitasking on your phone. And uh, so it's, you know, th there's a lot of different ways to engage in gaming. There's single player games, something like Wordle again, right? There's multiplayer games, which can be both either synchronous or asynchronous. And synchronous games are games that you both have to be in the game at the same time to play it. Something like, let's say, I don't know, like like tic tac -toe, tic tac toe, where you're both in the game at the same time and you're seeing what the other player does, and then you move. And then you can also have asynchronous games, and that's where you can, you know, if if you played like words with friends or like draw with draw with friends back in the day, that's a game where you make your move, it gets stored on the server, and then when your friend comes in, they see what the last thing was that happened. You know, they have to guess the word or they draw, they figure out what you tried to doodle and then they can make their move. And then the game is continuous. 
So you're still playing with someone or you're playing against someone, but you don't both have to be in the game at the exact same time in order for the game to, to, to continue. It just will continue as people pop in and out. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, just interesting considerations there with things like privacy, right? Like what is the game storing about you? What is the game storing about your friends? How long is that information kept? What can they do with that information? Especially in the case of like asynchronous games. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for something casual like Words with Friends, the privacy issues are not as serious, right? Like they'll probably have something like an email or a login for you. But there's also games that can have things like UGC, right? User generated content where you can create things as, as part of the gameplay. And then what are they storing about you there? Or games mm -hmm. that are like, um, you know, games that ask questions. So information about like having you take a poll and see if you or your friend are better able to predict the outcome of future mm -hmm. events, right? And then in that case, some of the poll questions might give away a little bit more about the user than something like a doodling game where you're just, you know, given a word and asked to draw. So there's a lot of different things to factor in. And then of course, with mobile gaming, everything that impacts a platform is something that has to be considered as well. Right, so we, we can get into that in, in a little bit. Yeah, definitely, and and that's super helpful. And I guess, you know, there's all kinds of it's quite a spectrum of gaming, right? Whether it's like casual, ultra casual, and competitive. So, in your view, um, where does a game move from being um, just casual gaming to competitive gaming, and then maybe even the next step to like what would you define as like an esports, right? Like if I were to set up a league with like words with friends and you know we all kind of do like a round robin tournament or something um would that then in your view take a casual game into the esports realm or is that not how it's viewed um by folks in your industry um so i would defer back to irene's definition because she's definitely the expert on esports and um, what i would say is that of course there's fr there's friends who play things competitively but esports really is a, a, like a, a professional kind of mm -hmm. uh, environment, right? So it's kind of like saying, you know, you and your friends play three on three basketball on Saturdays. Is that the same as participating in the NBA? Like not really, you could, you know, you could still compete and make your own tournament, mm -hmm. but it's not, that's not really the same caliber. Um, I, I think another thing that's interesting about gaming is that there's a lot more women who are involved in casual and hyper casual gaming than is perceived. And I think part of it is how we use terminology so you know people say like I'm a gamer and men are more likely to say I'm a gamer than women are but when you look at things like casual or hyper casual games a lot of the people who play those games are people who uh, identify as women you know especially when you think of games like Candy Crush or um, you know games that like King or that Zynga uh, develop and release those kinds of games they have a, a high percentage and mm -hmm. sometimes more than uh, more than 50% are, are, are women. Um, so I think it's, I don't, I don't know for esports how, how the division is, Irene, if it's more, if it's more men who tend to compete in, in esports competitions or if it's pretty evenly divided. Yeah, for the professional uh, level, it's it's pretty heavily male. However, when you look at the landscape, it's a, they think that the numbers were 40 something or for close to 40% women. Um, but what's also interesting is that uh, the spend in the industry is more from women in terms of dollar values. Um, and then uh, to your question, Jesse, because it's a question that is, is asked a lot, like what makes a game an eSport? Um, and uh, brighter minds than I always say, the answer is the audience decides what a game is an eSport um, in terms of how much competitive play there is. Um, and then something that folks um, have a difficult time understanding with esports is, you know, well, both folks say, well, I think Alina addressed this. I can game. Does that make me a professional player? It's like, well, no, I can play basketball, but that doesn't make me a Bron James, right? Um, these athletes are truly athletes. The folks mm -hmm. that play on a competitive level, I mean, they're really something else. And, and they train all day, every day, just like professional athletes do. Okay, got it. Yeah, very, very helpful distinctions and some interesting facts about, um, I guess, the split between male and female in the gaming and esports world. Um, Alina, just turning back to you, we'll ask the same questions we asked um, Irene. So what are the, you know, regulatory concepts, frameworks um, that kind of govern your day to day um, and the gaming world? Sure, yeah. So I mean, I think um, when, you, when you think of gaming from a legal perspective, you kind of just 
the way that we look at it is we break down like what a game is, right? Like what makes up a game. And of course, I'm not really going to touch on any of the hardware stuff because I, I focus on mobile gaming, but there is also, you know, considerations for, you know, PCs, consoles, mm -hmm. AR, VR, especially if you have some kind of like, you know, headset or something you need to wear in order to participate. So I'm not touching on any of that. Um, but, you know, when you think of a game, you're, you have to think like what makes a game, like mm -hmm. what is it, right? And so there's a, a lot of different frameworks that apply both to platforms generally, right? Like things like Child Online Privacy Protection Act to make sure that your game is safe for the audience that you say that it's for. There's also voluntary um, rating boards where your game is rated based on, you know, how violent or nonviolent it is so that it's, you know, it'll impact which, uh, you know, which platforms you can be on, you know, what the minimum age is that it says you, mm -hmm. you have to be to play, et cetera. But then there's also just general legal issues, right? So for example, IP and licensing. Um, one thing that I, sometimes um, younger attorneys get confused in is that generally gameplay is not intellectual property that can be protected, right? So it's the gameplay itself can't be protected, but the characters and the artwork and the, you know, the name and the brand and those things can be. So there are sometimes issues with, you know, developers, especially mm -hmm. smaller developers coming up with the same idea or the same gameplay or, uh, you know, similar concepts and then saying like, hey, so-and-so copied my game. And I think you can see that these days also with all the, you know, Candy Crush and then all the different versions of things that are like Candy Crush, right? Or now all the different mm -hmm. versions of the things that are like Wordle or other games. The gameplay, the underlying gameplay isn't um, something that you could go after someone um, for necessarily. Um, privacy is a big issue. Again, I mentioned that, but that's, you know, there's a lot of considerations there, especially once you start getting into games that either have some kind of like, have, have you involved in the game more, especially when, when we start talking about games in, you know, virtual or augmented reality, but also things like if you're either sharing more personal information um, or you're uh, creating user-generated content and within the game. So either like you're creating a world or you're, you know, writing things or mm -hmm. whatever else. And then with the UGC, the user-generated content, there's a whole slew of issues there as well, right? Like who owns that content? Um, how do you moderate it? You have to have, you know, terms, community guidelines, takedown processes, all these, all these things that, um, that go into that. And then, um, a big one for platforms is also monetization, right? Like how do you monetize the game? A lot of times it's things like advertising. And if, if you, especially if you download like a freemium game, right? Which is a game that you download on your phone for free. And then you can either pay for, to get rid of ads or you can pay for additional experiences within the game, like more turns and whatever else. Like a lot of those games are monetized with advertising. Usually sometimes it's like inconvenient advertising or it's like a really long ad, but you're really into the game. So you still watch it. Um, so yeah. it's, you know, factoring those things in and then other ways of monetizing games is having like in game goods, right? Um, digital, um, di digital tokens within the games where users can purchase the tokens with real money and then use those tokens to redeem them um, in the game for additional turns or additional experiences, or maybe, you know, to, to speed up a certain portion of the game or, or whatever else. Yeah. So there's a lot of considerations there because you um, want to make sure that if you are using some kind of digital uh, tokens in the game, that you're not inadvertently creating digital currency that then has to be regulated more strictly, right? So there's requirements about like not being able to refund in a specific way and not being able to, you know, making sure that the people you're selling it to are people who are old enough to contract with. So if you're, if you have a lot of young children playing games, you want to make sure that your terms are clear so that it's, you know, if you're making a purchase and you're 13, that you, the terms say that your parents have consented to this or they're the ones who are making the purchase. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of other, um, I think we, t we touched on gambling, but making sure you, your game play or uh, the way that the game is run doesn't inadvertently steer into the territory of gambling. Um, and I think a, a really interesting case that's currently ongoing is the class action lawsuit against Zynga in Washington, D.C. with um, games that are called social slot games. And um, that's something that, you know, the, the, big de the big developers really focus on to make sure they're, they're not accidentally in the, that territory because gambling is uh, highly regulated, of course, and it's not regulated uh, in the same way globally. So each state has its own gambling laws, each country has its own gambling laws. And if you kind of fall into that 
territory, you're basically exposing the company to a, to a lot of risk. And um, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of other considerations to, to factor in when working with developers, right? Like okay. if you're having a developer make a game for you, how do you figure out ownership, which platforms it can be on, all, all of those things. So it's really just kind of like breaking down the components of a game and looking at the different legal issues that can arise in all those areas. Okay, awesome. Yeah, you definitely unpacked um, a lot of stuff there. And it seems like there are a lot of things that keep your day-to-day -day very interesting um, and very busy. So thank you for that. Also very helpful background um, and a lot of issues in the gaming world that you know, like I just was not aware of. Um, so with that background on esports gaming, next um, we'll turn to Ellen. Um, and so we'll want to try to tie in kind of what's going on, what we're seeing in the professional sports world to what is developing in the esports and gaming spaces. Um, and, you know, as there usually is, there's a lag between technology and the law, and we often have regulators and society try to fit the existing frameworks, existing law into the new technology. Um, and, you know, often that lag can cause friction and issues um, and unique challenges. So with that, um, Irene mentioned sports integrity, and I think that's a good place to start here. And um, so when we say sports integrity, we're talking about things um, like unsanctioned betting, match fixing, doping, et cetera. And so um, Professor, from your experience, what types of um, integrity issues are you seeing in the esports and um, gaming realms? Well, first of all, great topics um i've been taking notes so learning from the other speakers for sure thank you to the um, american you know the Ar armenian bar association for having me and uh wonderful to see other women in the space as well so when um when i was listening to you know to the conversation i think i sort of wanted to go back to the definition and I'm not so sure we know whether it's a sport or entertainment. And I think that's, you know, that's almost the foundation that lawyers really like to define because from that, once you define that, different laws apply to sport versus entertainment. And we can get into that a little bit, but would love to have that conversation because there was a suit that was going to decide that and it was settled, the Tifu case. And uh, I think I think that's interesting. So getting into integrity, there is a group uh, called the Esports Integrity Coalition. And I just returned from their conference in London. And it's integrity is is a fascinating word if you look at it through the sports side, because why do people come and watch a game? It's about the unknown. Mm -hmm. And if we eliminate the unknown, no one will come. And so I think the word integrity gets thrown around, but in essence, it is about keeping the fans interested, keeping the play fair, in keeping those participating in the, in the activity um, healthy and safe. So when we look back on what integrity is and what the coalition is trying to do, I think Irene is correct. It's really difficult to mandate the publishers to become part of the integrity space because there is no incentive right now. Now, clearly, um, price, you know, match fixing, big issue, but also micro fix it. And so if you think about, I'm not going to throw the entire game, I'm just going to throw one, uh, one aspect of the game that's super tiny, but I know people are betting on, for example, what's my skin going to look like on my gun? Or do I shoot um, this round versus next round, or I'm the first to shoot. So that micro um, fixing or micro betting, as it's normally called, is definitely an integrity issue. And it's hard to check. How do you know somebody didn't do that? 
And so there's software that looks at that component of integrity and takes all your past performance and decides if this pattern of behavior is normal for you or does it stand out? And they use that in other um, sports as well. And so that's one thing. The other thing is just hacking. What is hacking? And so you can obviously, I know a lot of of my son's uh, friends, they'll use an off-market type software to put into their games so they can see behind the walls when they're perhaps uh, shooting someone. And I'm like, really? That, that's not the game. But they look at it as, and there's, there's books that you sell, How to Hack Minecraft. It's a series of books that I apparently had to get as a parent. And I think that, you know, it's one thing you're teaching your children that things can be hacked. It's another thing to take it to a whole nother level at the professional level. So hacking is critical. And um, I think the publishers obviously want to uh, dampen that out as much as possible. I, I think the, um, the other side of integrity really gets to the, the concept of safety and health. And this is, this is what you're talking about, which is safe sport. And as you alluded to in the beginning, I sit on the Safe Sport International Board and really esports has not been in that space and what that looks like. If it's considered a sport, what is what is that safety look like? So you were asking how many women are part of this space, whether it's amateur, casual or pro. One thing is the toxic atmosphere. And that goes to being safe. Do you feel discriminatory? Do you feel safe coming into that space? Are people making you feel, you know, discriminated against or harassed and or sexually harassed? And so having those guidelines that Alina was talking about are really critical in order to build an activity that is neutral gender wise doesn't have to be male and female, could be LGBTQ. And so wouldn't it be great if we could finally build something from the start that is equal access and equal welcoming, as opposed to following the same footsteps that our other sports leagues have, where it took 30 years to really start thinking about youth development, safe sport. And so we continue to make the same mistakes, which aggravates me to no end. And and also just in safe sport, there's one topic that I'm sort of fascinated with, which is grooming. We know how uh, there's lots of studies about how coaches groom um, victims over a period of time, like in soccer or softball or sports like that. We don't have a lot of studies on how um, people are grooming on the online space to get access to these to these gamers. And so lots of information that we still have a void that need to be focused on. I hope that that sort of touched upon some of the things that you're thinking about in safe sport. Yeah, it certainly did. And so how would you then recommend, um, you know, if you were the decision maker and you kind of had free reign here, how would you incorporate, to the extent you can answer, right, safe sport um, into esports and gaming? Are there monitoring systems that should be used? Is it more guidance for parents who are letting um, younger children access either mobile gaming or get involved in more of the professional side of esports? Well, we we know there are monitoring companies that are looking at safe sport to be engaged in this process. For example, communication between a coach and and a and a gamer. What are some key words that we want the algorithm to pull out to give us some red flags to make sure that we monitor those? Mm-hmm. And so being online lends itself a lot easier than you're on the field and there's a a language on the field itself. So I do think there'll be more companies getting into that space. Um, But you really touch upon one core issue is there is no 
Players Association. Mm -hmm. And the reason why players associations have been created in the past, even the NCAA, if you can believe this today, mm -hmm. was originally created because players were dying on the field in the turn of the century. And so many players associations get created not because what people think today, which is I want more money in the salary component, but really about health, safety, integrity, fairness. And so some of the things that you are raising would be normally taken care of by a players association. And so several years ago, um, I was contacted by some Overwatch players to create a players association. And our main goal was just that, how long should we be playing? What are the breaks? Should we have trainers? Should we have massage therapists to deal with our aching backs and spines and corporal tunnel syndrome? And so those health issues. What about the e-doping, which gets into, are you taking medication to stay up, to have better reaction times? These are things, concussions that NFL players took care of, these are things that players associations normally focus on and at, at, at a group, sort of a helicopter view, and then take a deep dive. And so that's what we're missing. And there really is no incentive, uh, urgent incentive for the publishers to take a huge amount of their revenue and begin to focus on this. So where we are in the player association space, I'll give you two examples. Um, Riot decided, well, we're going to create our own players association. So we call that a company union. I use that in loose quotes. Um, and they hired a, a, an executive director that was paid by the publisher, Riot. And so you really begin to question how that independence doesn't exist. And therefore, how much would management and, uh, and the union and the association really go at it for particular working conditions, wages, and benefits. There is a CSGO association. I think a lot of times people use the word association, but then don't realize, is it a trade association? It is a union? Is it a players? Like, what is that word association? And we're global. So the CSGO is, is housed outside the US and really no publisher is required under law to, to even meet with an organization like CSGO Players Association. Now they could have influence if they all collectively got together and didn't perform their duties, uh, but we haven't seen that yet. And one of the reasons is it's a global sport as been alluded to, and it's very hard to unionize the thought process when you have athletes from Asia and they don't even have unions in China per se. And so one reason why I thought Overwatch was the best place to start a players association was because the companies are based in the US, there's US law, you have the National Labor Act and so forth. And then what you find like most industries, if you begin to have um, working conditions and benefits and wages really sought after in one game, you will see the other games perhaps begin to meet those standards that are built in one game. But until that process, you're going to see different organizations, which there are, uh, popping up, trying to fill the void of a players association. For example, Esports Integrity Coalition is launching out an agent certification process. That is something normally done by the Players Association because there are gamers getting uh, ripped off by their agents. And so we don't have a mechanism to bring those two parties together to decide the dispute mm -hmm. because no one's part of an association. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, and to all of your points, the parallels between the issues, um, you know, as different as the virtual electronic esports spaces from the physical sports we're kind of used to, um, you know, there are a lot of parallels in the issues that these athletes and, and the gamers and players face. Um, 
hopefully we'll get it right this time, but uh, TBD, I guess. Um, so this was all very, very helpful. And in the last um, you know, 15 minutes, I'd like to devote maybe 10 minutes to just talking about some of the issues um, that we've highlighted some of the, the trends that we're seeing um, and you know, kind of open it up to whoever has an opinion on this, um, given that there's probably no one right answer and it's um, a bit of guesswork. And so one of the things I find um, interesting and one of the biggest changes that might be coming up in the gaming um, and esports world is virtual reality and augmented reality and how these are incorporated into esports um, and gaming. And so maybe Irene, Alina, um, if you can kind of just start us off and talk about how virtual reality and augmented reality um, might affect esports and gaming and where that could lead. Um, I think that would be helpful to hear. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's helpful to just start with a quick definition for each of those, because sometimes people use them interchangeably, not in the <laughs> right way. So virtual reality is um, if you think of something like where, where you put on a headset and the, your entire space is consumed by a virtual uh, environment that isn't that doesn't exist in the real world right um, something like an oculus headset augmented reality is when there's an overlay on your actual world so i think the the easiest example of that is the pokemon go game which is like was and maybe still is a sensation i don't know but all of my nephews and nieces were like obsessed with it and used to make their parents drive them to like random parts of the city because some, you know, some Pokemon was there that was like really unique and they had to get it because their friends got it. Um, so that's augmented reality. You're still in your actual environment, but it's enhanced with um, virtual mm -hmm. either characters or just, you know, things that you can see through your phone screen that you can't actually see in the real world because they're not there. And so, um, you know, for for virtual reality specifically, because that's that's more the the, the space. Than, uh, sorry, for augmented reality and not virtual reality, there's just general considerations like safety, right? Like uh, kids getting hit by a car because they're like running after a Pokemon at the gym or whatever it is, and not minding their surroundings or uh, trespassing, right? Like there there was cases of uh, children going onto people's properties because the maps that Pokemon Go was using hadn't been updated and didn't reflect that actually this is someone's house now it's not a public park or a museum or whatever else and so there's you know there's there's those kinds of considerations and then of course um thinking about things like monetization like there's ways to monetize that as well right like maybe you can do a partnership with a brand where they want people to show up to their store as part of some kind of a game experience or you know starbucks wants you to come in and if you find whatever thing is hiding in their store, you get like a free coffee or, or something like that. So it's really about um, creative ways of getting the individual to interact with their environment and do something that they want and that they enjoy, but at the same time that could, for example, benefit a brand or, or um, a, a store or a location um, or, you know, f f like uh, interactive experiences during like a time when a movie is being released or during um, you know, some kind of a concert or, or some some event like that. Yeah, we just um, <clears throat> did a panel with LAIPLA with Microsoft and Riot Games on this issue. So it was really interesting um, to get their perspective. Um, on the virtual reality side, there's all sorts of issues, a lot of IP issues. And for those interested in reading more about it, um, the second life cases that have already happened in the virtual reality context are, are really fascinating. Um, Alina was mentioning user generated content. That's going to be a huge thing in the virtual world because for platforms that allow you to create any part of the virtual world, you know, there'll be questions of who owns that IP. I mean, in the virtual world, you also have a lot of um, folks um, misusing or using unauthorized uh, versions of brands. So brands have, you know, that's kind of like the second life cases that brands have been suing for the unauthorized use of their IP or, you know, sending takedown notices. Um, as Alina was mentioning, the AR co uh, context with uh, Pokemon, that's going to be really interesting. I think AR in the near future is going to be more of a thing than VR and how we use it in all contexts is going to be fascinating. Um, you see the game publishers already doing this in some context. It will be interesting how it's going to be used in traditional sports. I know there's talks of like, imagine you going to stadium 
putting on sunglasses and all of a sudden you see different things throughout the stadium, right? Whether it's stats of the players being uh, viewed through your lens or other things that could be popping up throughout the stadium. So um, that's, I think, more of a near future um, prospect than like the total immersed, inoperable metaverse, which many minds disagree on whether those <laughs> exist or not exist. Yeah, I mean, even in the Second Life, there was a case about sexual harassment. Um, so definitely take a look at that, those areas. We, we've got some precedent. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, what Ellen was mentioning on the the issues that women face in the industry and in the gameplay. I mean, it's it's really unfortunate and really crazy. Uh, and it's something I'm passionately focused on. We work with a lot of gaming companies on that on the labor and employment side. I mean, but just look at what happened uh, recently with gaming companies and the allegations of sexual harassment and discrimination and pay inequity. And you had California, the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, and then the federal EEOC um, duking it out over who's going to take control over these cases when those agencies usually don't sue. And the fact that employers and the fact that they're focusing on the gaming industry, they're hyper focused on what's happening um, and trying to make an example uh, of gaming. So all gaming companies should be focused on their inclusion efforts globally. I also think Title IX is going to play a role at the collegiate level. There's over 400 schools that have club and uh, scholarship level. And so look for how Title IX may deal with some of the gender equity issues. Interesting stuff. Um, and a lot of very developing um, areas as well. So I have like a long list of questions on the issues um, and everything to talk about. Um, more questions now um, after hearing each of the panelists speak. But um, given, you know, we've kind of talked about um, women in esports gaming, um, and given that we have an all um, female panel, I think we would kind of be remiss not to maybe discuss um, some of your paths um to where you know how you got to where you did your experiences um and what you would you know suggest for other um women who want to get involved in the industry and also um you know just generally um anyone who wants to get in the industry and so you know ellen we have you here um you have had quite an accomplished career and you've been quite the trailblazer um in many aspects of your career um and that's kind of highlighted by being the first female um, agent in the NFL. And so maybe starting with you, if you can just kind of give us um, like a brief primer on your career path, how you got to where you did um, and what challenges you faced that you think um, others might still be facing and how you overcame them and what advice you'd give. So I know that's a lot there. <laughs> Feel free to answer any or none of those questions. Um, just turning it I got I got to work on my book, right? Um, yeah. So so I think two things come to mind. I mean, we're at the Armenian Bar Association. So let's talk a little bit about being Armenian in the space. Um, I told my dad that I was speaking at this. He's, he's 92 and he's at work. So he said he didn't have time to hop on. Uh, this, this is what I'm brought up with. This is the work ethic of going. And I said to him, you know, it was interesting. We were talking about you know, whether an Armenian father would support, you know, I said, you know, dad, I, I never took your, I never seen anything you've done that was not supportive. And obviously I come from a, a family business of over a hundred years. So it was very easy that my dad says every week, come back to the family business. Um, but you know, his response was, you, you brought me around, you made me see the light. And I thought, wow, like I didn't even know he felt that way. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's about those incremental steps. Um, and one thing I will say that, um, you know, I had very strong women in my life, so can't, can't beat that. My dad married a strong woman, can't beat that. 
But I would say overall, the best advice my dad ever gave me was, um, you know, you're, you're not, you, you know, you're never really that relevant. You're always chasing that next step. And when publicity started coming my way very early on in my career, I remember going out and getting the paper that I was featured in uh, USA Today and I brought it in and my dad never read it. And he said, I'm worried about what you're gonna do tomorrow. I'm not worried about what you've already done today. And I think that's sort of that Armenian philosophy that we, we are a small group of people that when we get together, it's critical we stay together, be supportive, and develop the community. And that's how I look at this session. It's, it's about being supportive. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. Um, terrific insights. And I think a lot of us can relate, whether it's like that A minus your parents harp on, or, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? It's like, yeah, <laughs> very relatable. Um, so maybe Alina, we'll turn to you next. Um, I don't know, you know, how much um, your experience was very similar to Ellen's or not, but we'd love to hear, um, you know, anything you had to say on your path to, to getting the SNAP and being Associate General Counsel. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, when we were preparing for this panel, we were talking about it, I, I joked about how my parents will every once in a while will still be like, why don't you just start your own law firm, right? Like they don't, they don't understand like the, the, the space that I'm in really, they didn't grow up with gaming. Um, the, it's not, you know, the, they watch YouTube and things like that, but they're not really into an interactive games or those kinds of experiences on, on mobile. Um, so I think my one advice would just be figure out what you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be gaming, but if it is, follow that. Um, there's definitely, um, as I mentioned, a lot of women who, you know, and, and people who identify as women who participate in, in casual and hyper-casual games. But in terms of on the on the legal side, it's still most of the people who I, you know, work or work with or negotiate against are men. Once in a while, I'm pleasantly surprised and I work with a developer and the attorney representing them is also a woman and it's really great. Um, it's definitely a, a, a growing space. Um, so I would say don't be discouraged just because the space doesn't have a lot of women in it yet. Um, just just go after that or a lot of Armenian people right just just go after that and you you can be the first like like Ellen was in a lot of the spaces um, and then one day you hopefully won't have to be the first right and you'll be you know the hundredth or the thousandth person who's already done that and so I would just say focus on what you're interested in because that to me is the easiest way to succeed if you really are passionate and interested in what you're doing as opposed to following the path that either you know your parents think you should follow or our community thinks you should follow. You should really focus on what it is that gets you excited in the morning and, and do that. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. And Irene, um, any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, I mean, exactly to what Alina said, I got involved in the space because gaming has always been a passion of mine. Uh, I played when uh, all the time, uh, when I had more time. <laughs> Um, and so when the opportunity came up to focus on uh, the industry it was a no brainer for me because it's just something I like to do right and so what Alina is saying is focus on what you like to do and you will be successful because when you're investing so many hours into something it's not a drain it's it is it's inspiring to you and you will keep doing it um, and as long as you keep doing it you'll most likely be successful in one way or the other and then um Alina actually recently put together a panel of, of uh, mentors for um, Armenian women in law schools, and it was really interesting to talk to those women. And I think the message that came up, up really strongly across was, you know, surround yourself with people who support you, um, friends, significant others, and don't let anyone try to dim your light um, and because it's just never going to work. Yeah, um, this turned into quite the motivational panel. Um, it's getting me pumped up too. Um, who knows? Maybe I'm still looking for some of my interests, but after this um, talk, I'll go explore them. Um, so, if folks have any questions, feel free to submit them. We'll try to get to them, but um, we may not. And you can always submit them through um, the Armenian Bar Association's website um, or connect with the panelists as well. But um, in the last couple minutes, so what I'll do 
is I'm going to send a link to a survey. So if all the panelists who participated can take that survey, it's very short and it'll just help us better tailor um, upcoming panels. Um, and while I circulate that, I'd like to just ask each panelist in the last two minutes we have um, to briefly give us um, your thoughts on where you see esports um, and gaming and what you think is important in the space, whether that be involvement of women making it safer, whatever it is. So just very quickly, where you either see it going or where you would like to see it going. Um, and for that, um, Ellen, you're unmuted. So we'll start with you. Okay, so I'm going to take off from the comment in the chat regarding as a parent, I need to find out more information about this. And so I am a parent. And uh, my son has started breakdancing. So why not get breakdancing into the Olympics? And my son does esports and, you know, with his friends, not at a professional level. And I thought, well, I better learn about this. So I think what my takeaway would be is I do think parents need to be engaged. Um, there is a lot of data being collected on their children. It's being sold, kept, um, and advanced. And I think just we're just starting to find out what what gaming can do to the mind, um, how it affects suicide, self self preservation. All those things are still being learned. And I think as a parent, we should stay on top of those issues. Okay. And then next, maybe Alina. Sure, um, I would just uh, really quickly wanted to touch on um, what's going on in Armenia. And I think um, Irene has a few points for that as well, but I think there's a lot of uh, smaller developers and growing develop developer companies in Armenia that are focused on things like mobile gaming, um, you know, game development, uh, AR, augmented reality, right? There's AR Lupa, which is a pretty well-known company in Armenia. And I would just say that um, I think it's it's a growing space there, which is really exciting um, because for something like gaming, you don't geographically have to necessarily even be in the same country or half of the world as as your clients or your customers or the people who play your game. And so I'm just really excited about what's what's happening in Armenia and hoping that we can see more uh, games and experiences and uh, AR experiences that are developed by Armenians in, on a, a global landscape. Okay, awesome. And Irene. Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback off what Alina said, with now NVIDIA uh, establishing some operations in Armenia, I mean, it's a great opportunity for the emerging tech sector there to become more involved in the gaming industry. And the gaming industry, people don't realize, is one of the biggest uh, money-making industries in the world. Um, and so there's only things to be gained there. Um, but there's all sorts of, as Alan was pointing out, issues uh, to be resolved in the space. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for that. And thank you to all of our panelists. Really appreciate your insights. It was extremely informative um, for me and I'm sure for all the participants. And thank you to the Armenian Bar Association as well for um, allowing us to host this webinar series. So I think with that, um, you know, apologies for the questions we didn't get to in the chat, but we'll conclude here um, to the participants. Uh, again, please complete the survey. Feel free to reach out to us. You can find our contact information on our various firms' um, websites or LinkedIn um, if you wanted to connect on anything. So with that, thank you, thank you to everyone. Um, really appreciate your time and looking forward to the next webinar. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you. Bye.